Thank you, Andre. Good evening, everyone here in Chicago and wherever else you are. I'm going to mention first, I was just about to explain to the people in the room here that uh, for a very long time, I haven't written out anything I say because the first time I did it or way back at the New York branch in the 90s, it was so wooden that I thought I would never do it again. Recently, however, when I start writing out notes for things, they've been coming out in full paragraphs. And so now I have pretty much the whole thing written out. And my question is, <clears throat> if it were poetry, I'd know what to do with it. Time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future and so forth, T.S. Eliot. <clears throat> but uh, this is going to be more of a struggle. And, uh, you know, I practiced a little earlier today. I practiced trying to read it uh, with a bit of the cadences and so forth of uh, uh, President Obama. Um, that was a little too obvious. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Dr. King would be much too obvious. <clears throat> so I don't know, It's this is an experiment that way. And you'll probably notice when I go off the cuff, but I'm trying to uh, get more precise about what I'm sharing here. And uh, what I want to say to begin with is humanity needs something at this point in time. Humanity is not in great shape. My first spiritual teacher was Gustav Mahler and his uh, resurrection symphony after the orchestra does about an hour. Then the human voice comes in and it says in German, O oh, red rose, the human being lies in deepest need. The human being lies in deepest pain. Well, humanity doesn't have a lot to rely on at this point. And I think there are two great liberating questions that could transform the way human beings feel about themselves and the future. One is the idea of evolution, but not just evolution as we have it, human evolution, the active continuing evolution of human beings now. Nobody is talking about that. Everybody in anthroposophical circles says, uh-huh, yes, right. Nobody else says anything about that. The idea that we're changing, that we're not a finished thing, would change our entire perspective on what's going on. But we're basically the top of the primate level and we're finished, and <clears throat> now we either get it together fast or the machines replace us, right? Um, no, we need to understand that we are evolving. I'll get into that more. The other question <clears throat> is the question of the survival of each of us as individuals, the survival of our individuality, the acting, <clears throat> the uh, the question we generally refer to as reincarnation. And it's interesting that something like 100 million Americans say they believe in it. Well, what is it they believe in? Well, they believe there, there's, yeah, there is a reincarnation. Well, they believe there is a reincarnation, but what does that tell them? Reincarnation is a very big deal once you begin to feel it. Once you begin to feel that this is a life and not the life that I have to live, you have to begin making adjustments. How did I get here? Where am I going next? What does it matter what I'm doing? And everybody knows the word karma. Absolutely everybody knows the word karma these days, but what meaning do they have attached to it? So these two big things, human evolution and reincarnation, if introduced into the general cultural conversation, would change everything. And we anthroposophists have that knowledge. And 
it's going nowhere from us, honestly. I'm a communications person, factor that into my viewpoint. I'm about broadcasting, which in the parable of the sower is throwing the seeds out wide. We're in a global civilization now. Maybe we ought to be, you know. Anyway, for civilization to advance, these two questions really need to come forward together. They will have to be brought forward in a relationship that people will be interested in to begin with, will say, oh yeah, I'm interested in that question. And they'll see, okay, well, how I am and how things are, are maybe a little bit bigger and more interesting than I've known so far. People begin to feel that, again, everything will change. Human beings are incredible. We can do incredible things when we have an idea that it's really worth doing. Who wanted to stand on the moon? Now we want to send billionaires to Mars, which may be a good idea. I am ad-libbing there. <laughs> Rudolf Steiner's great civilizational initiative, note my characterization, called Anthroposophy, has far-reaching transformative insights into both of these big questions. These insights of Steiner's were designed to connect to the present time, his time, to embrace the strengths of modern science and modern culture. We're still living in that, we talk most postmodern, but we're still modern. And they allow us all to accomplish safely and consciously a major transition in world existence. Some of the things Steiner had to say are, you know, Jules Verne, if anyone remembers him. Science fiction, the return of the moon to Earth, and so forth. The end of human reproduction. Um, there are all kinds of wild things out there from Steiner, but they all fit together. And if you just take the present moment and begin to open it out, you begin to see how extraordinary the human being is. Because this anthroposophia, anthroposophy, is a new, larger understanding of the human being in a modern context, but with all of the background of ancient consciousness and ancient wisdom. So Steiner's effort succeeded, has succeeded so far only in a fragmentary way. It's the very breadth and depth and richness of his project that kind of blinds us to its incompleteness. It's got education, it's got agriculture, it's got special needs and communities, it's got arts, it's got approaches to science, it's got medicine. What we even don't have is the sense that this really was a Gesamtkunstwerk, the Germans had a word for it, a total artistic work, a new civilization in outline. That's what he brought us. Andrei Bieli, the uh, great Russian novelist, seems to be the only one who really, and even Marie Steiner and Ida, Ida Bagman, as great as they understood Steiner's work to be, don't carry it to the place I think it needs to be carried. We are building a global civilization. We are going to have a global civilization. And if it doesn't include a lot of what Rudolf Steiner offered and has been developed further and we can develop further, it won't be a desirable global civilization. So <clears throat> Andre Bielli gave us the picture of someone coming from far away bearing an enormous gift. And people were able to take parts of the gift, but there was no place that this visitor could set the whole thing down. And so at the end, he had to turn away and take it away with him. That was Andre Bielli's artistic picture. 
So I see two things we need to do. We need to recognize and appreciate the full scope of this project. It is the foundations of a new world culture. And I'm sure each and every one of us tonight feel completely capable of stepping up to the task of making that better known and happen, right? It's a little joke. We must make the presentation of this project, which can only be carried out by individuals, clear and contemporary for the latest generations. New languaging, new organization of the essential ideas, inclusion of development since 1925, and of course, the new media, which have so radically changed things in the last 30 years. Tonight, I am sharing how I'm attempting or starting to attempt to contribute to these two goals. My effort was begun 40 years ago and more or less laid down some time ago. It was brought back to life two years ago by the interest and encouragement of a young member of the audience tonight, someone who is now following his own challenging path in mathematics and science and consciousness studies, on to the Gertianum. He gave a presentation here uh, in August, I think. <clears throat> While I greatly appreciate the interest, the warm interest of older friends and members for the 33 years I've been involved in the society, the quality of inspiring young people, and I know several, is a special kind of motivator. There are two other younger people known here at the Rudolf Steiner branch in Chicago that I know about, <clears throat> there are probably more, whose work in art and music and consciousness are also inspiring to me. It is above all the persons themselves because human beings are really the most extraordinary thing in the cosmos, human individuals. It's the persons themselves, Russell and Lucian and Ultraviolet here in Chicago, who by their fine ambitions, their work on themselves and their generosity of spirit, remind me poignantly that the future of humanity is always worth fighting for. As Shakespeare's Miranda says in The Tempest, oh, the first time she sees human beings besides her father, Oh, wonder, how many goodly creatures are there here? How beauteous mankind is. Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. And as Walt Whitman said, individuals, underneath all, individuals, I swear nothing is good to me now that ignores individuals. There is the central point, individuality. Or as I choose to call it for purposes of being better understood today, identity. A word which introduces some useful confusion. I combine the two big questions of the uh, evolution and the reincarnation in, for the moment at least, a phrase, the journey of identity or the journey of the I am. It takes place in humanity and each individual life, and it takes place across millenniums. I recognize the challenge of advancing Rudolf Steiner's project, revealing its scope, renewing its availability, by speaking henceforth not of anthroposophy, but of, shall we say, the Being Human Project. Anybody can understand that. As of today, I have a five-step presentation, which is, of course, way too much for now. Maybe I can say something useful about the first step tonight, and I will tell you at the end how I'm planning to go forward with this. And I realize I'm not screen sharing, which I should be doing.
And we're doing a little complicated thing here. Let's see. <laughs> now I hope that's visible and you've already been with me through the first parts here. So there are five parts in this, and for folks here in the room, they go from the bottom up. This is the way I'm imagining presenting this, and it will need an enormous amount of work, and it will need possibly a huge amount of development in each area. <clears throat> but the fundamental one, the bottom one, is understanding identity as the evolutionary superpower of humanity and every individual. And I use the current colloquial sense of superpower in, you know, like making arrangements for our trips is my superpower. You know, people are, are aware I'm really good at something. Human beings are really good at identity. Second level, affirming true fundamental values in religion, politics, science, society, ecology. Is this big enough for everyone? <laughs> the thing about Steiner's offering is that it touches so many bases. It's not a little thing out of idealistic philosophy or a little thing out of, you know, some field of science or mathematics, or it's, it's got stars lighted up all over the place. They need constellating. They need uh, <clears throat> connecting up. But what he brought in its scope, if it's presented well, is very convincing because it's, it's a full contrast with the way we're doing things now. We've got an ex economic explanation of everything. We've got the technological explanation of everything. We've got religious explanations of everything. And they're all completely inadequate, uh, in my humble opinion. I use the word fundamental here because fundamentalism, which began in religion in Princeton in the 1890s, you know, religion is slipping away from us. We have to grasp the fundamentals and hold on to those. Fundamentalism has taken hold of almost everything. Some people feel it's taking hold of anthroposophy sometimes. But it's the idea that there are just a few things we've got to understand and hold on to. And it's remarkable how people get those wrong. I won't be going into this much tonight, but... Um, just in the religious area, if there's going to be something fundamental for people who call themselves Christians, when in the Gospels, Jesus Christ says, he's asked, what's the great commandment? And he quotes Moses, gives a first great commandment, and says, a second is like unto it. That's the one we all remember. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, he's given the two great commandments. I don't hear anything about them from fundamentalists or evangelists or or uh, liberal theologians. I mean, I'm sure people have talked about them. They're both about identity. That's what I mean by getting to the true foundations. For Christians, that ought to be fundamental. And Rudolf Steiner is the one who pointed me to that. So that's the second one, affirming true fundamentals. <clears throat> Third is living into new perspectives for personal growth, resilience, self-reliance. There we have guidance from people like Steiner and philosophy of freedom uh, from Thoreau. And of course, a lot of his inspiration from Emerson's self-reliance from uh, the Romantics, Fichte, the philosophy of the I, the Ich, uh, Nietzsche's 
fighting for freedom, as, as Steiner put it. And then we have all of this self-help counseling and personal growth of the last 40 or 50 years. People are all over this question. Where's it getting us to? It's helping individuals. It's doing great things for individuals. Can we make sense of it as something that's part of humanity's evolution? The next one, surveying battlefields of the war on truth and freedom. I'd say on truth, identity, and freedom. That's self-explanatory, perhaps, if you're paying attention to any of the news or politics. And finally, reshaping, well, I should be on the battlefields, I just should mention Bernard Leibowitz's book, The Battle for the Soul, uh, which older anthroposophists have probably heard of or run into or read. And uh, that uh, our own president, like him or not, Joe Biden, uh, talked about running in 2020 as a battle for the soul of America. There's some awareness that there's a battle for the soul going on. It isn't just esotericists. Finally, <clears throat> what would a healthy gro global culture look like? to organize some of what Steiner brought, as much as we can, as much as we've learned ourselves, our own experience. Steiner isn't the end of things. He's just an awful lot of useful beginnings. To organize that into a picture of here's how humanity's future should look. This is, or could look. This is what it could look like. And when you get to when you get past the kind of sociological quality of most of our discussion of threefolding to get to fairly simple things, identity again is central. If we recognize each other's identity, and he talks about the sixth ethic, we begin to see that the other person is someone extraordinary, cosmic that there are no great and no small. As Steiner says, that we are all divinities. Politics totally changes. If we then look to the side of identity at caring, if as Steiner suggested, we don't walk past other people and their needs, because of what we feel, but we feel it as if we were injured, we were in need, we were suffering in our own body, that will extend out. That changes economics. If we look at other people and say, well, they're doing whatever they're doing, that's great. Look at how talented they are. Look at what they can do. More power to them. That's the dimension of freedom and culture. Let's not be abstract about this. Dostoevsky already wrote about it in the 1880s. God bless you if you can bring a gift to the world. We recognize that when somebody sits down at the piano or another instrument and does something beautiful. We don't say, oh, I don't like that. They're better than I am. They say, wow, great. That's the kind of future we need to try to present to the world if we're going to do justice, in my view, to what Rudolf Steiner brought us. So here for the folks online is a picture of it. It's uh, done by hand on the board here. So what is identity? It's from the Roman word for sameness, oneness, being the same. And we don't, in our circles, we haven't used identity as the word because it goes in two directions. 
It indicates the core, I, core uniqueness of an individual, my identity. I'm the same person I was yesterday, even though I was asleep for a third of the time since then. And I don't know where I was when I was asleep. I'm the same person. I'm still me. I'm the same person, you know, was born a long time ago in Cody, Wyoming. I'm the same. That's my identity. That's individuality as we use it. More often though, identity connects a person with different groups. We say that we belong to those groups. Hmm. Just about everything that can be said about me can connect me with a group. I'm old, I'm white, I'm male, I'm an anthroposophist, I guess I am still a Protestant, a wasp, I'm tall, I'm an American, I'm of Scottish ancestry. I belong to all these groups. Some of them have no pull on me, but a lot of them do. That's a little bit of a challenge, isn't it? So identity means continuing to be what I am day by day and belonging through my characteristics to many, many groups which can pull us in different directions. So what's our largest group that we can belong to with our whole being? Humanity. I am a human being. And funny thing, you are too. And it is one belonging that doesn't make an issue for us. You know? Everything about each one of us, I think, is human. In fact, I would say that everything about each of us is included in the condition of being human. So this is an odd thing. Humanity is a collection of beings to which we belong. That's one aspect. It is a quality which we share. You might call that humanness, but we call it humanity or humaneness. And it is something which has its own life and reality. There is such a thing as humanity, which isn't just the pile of human beings on the planet at the moment. Goethe in his time did say, humanity isn't a reality. <clears throat> it's uh, just a collective name. I don't think that's true anymore. I think it was true back when he was walking from Weimar to Jena in, you know, 40 minutes, checking out the botanical garden and so forth. You know, when somebody's <clears throat> taking a call from their, a video call from their friend in Thailand, and they're talking about going to Mongolia and, you know, whatever. It's, it's changed. There is a, an awakening of humanity as such. So there's this tug which we have to account for that we aren't part of humanity in a way like a wolf is part of wolves. But humanity has its character and development and each of us have our character and development. So we're like running the old uh, three-legged race at the at the uh, state fair. You tie, stand next to somebody and tie your adjacent legs together and then try to beat the other people in a race down to a finish line. What humanity is doing if humanity is falling behind? You know, what was humanity for Rudolf Steiner? <laughs> he had so many disappointments in life, so many things he brought, which... But... He had a big enough picture that I think he actually ran that race incredibly well. Now, today, the general view is by our modern science that we belong to the animal kingdom. When we speak of kingdom in this sense, I don't know how many people think about it. Again, a little remark of Steiner somewhere. We mean a set of laws like those that kings used to give. You lived in this kingdom, you had the set of laws of that king. 
if you lived in that kingdom, you had a different set of laws, maybe the same, maybe different. And those laws govern everyone in that group. There were considered to be four kingdoms, mineral, plant, animal, and human. We used to be our own kingdom. That's not considered anymore. Was it true? Well, let's ask, do human beings belong entirely to the laws of animals? Mm, probably not. Probably not. So what's different? The fact is that the four kingdoms were like developmental stages, with the higher ones including the lower ones, but adding a new range of freedom. Minerals could assume a crystalline form. Beautiful, extraordinary. Plants included mineral content, but they could transform themselves in all kinds of ways in a fixed location. Animals included the plant growth and form power, but they could move about and create patterns of behavior. Humans have the power of forming, growing, maintaining, and elevating, we hope it's elevating, a personal identity, a self-consciousness, a self, an ego, an I. That's why we're our own kingdom. Rudolf Steiner went so far as to say, looking at developments uh, that are a little hard to imagine still, that we are each becoming our own species. Each human being is becoming its own species. There's at least one other big difference. Unlike most animals, we humans are not fully developed within days or hours of birth. Our youthfulness, and I mean higher animals, our youthfulness is stretched out a long time. The term is neoteny, N-E-O-T-E-N-Y. We don't adapt quickly to the world as do the young of other higher animals. You know, a newborn deer will be able to move with the adult deers in a few hours. We uh, aren't sexually mature quickly. That'll take 12 or 14 years. We don't claim our individual decision-making authority or our selfhood until typically we are in our late teens or used to be officially 21. And today, of course, we don't leave our parents' home until we're about 30. Ha ha. <laughs> it's not just for you. Once we're... <laughs> Once we're grown up, selfhood, the ego or I, is the center of our human consciousness. Selfhood, which all the other humans have, but it's not the same kind of selfhood you could speak of animals having. Leaving out our animal companions, our pets and so forth. But animals in nature, yeah. They're together in instinct. Their consciousness is not separate like ours. But wait a minute. Even when we're grown up, even when we're over 70, selfhood, the ego or I, is immature. Not yet fully developed. Not just for children, but for adult human beings and for humanity that we're running the three-legged race with as a whole. Humanity is not mature. So we're taking a long time to mature as individuals, and then we feel, well, I'm my own person. And then after a while, we discover, well, <laughs> I'm my own person, but I'm not exactly fully mature yet. And then Steiner comes along and says, yeah, well, and humanity isn't fully mature either. This is all not what we're thinking these days, but it's a liberating thought 
challenging but positive. The central power of humanity is not yet mature. If we understood that, we might slow down on all this process of judging each other and judging all of us. The thing that I heard first coming shortly after Earth Day at the end of the 60s, humanity is a rogue species destroying the planet and Earth would be better off without us. Well, you don't think that quite so quickly if you think we aren't mature yet in our humanness. You might think, well, let's hurry up and understand what maturity would look like and try to get there. So anyway, individuals grow up to find themselves a mature member of a not yet mature humanity. Whoa. So I've been uh, falling behind here on the slides because I'm not reading from them directly. The individual grows up to find themselves a mature member of a not yet mature humanity. Then we have interesting things to think about, such as the word selfish and the word selfless. Uh, selfish is sort of taken as meaning too much self, too much ego. But when you get the immature picture, you say, no, this is an expression of immaturity of selfhood. You're trying to get things which will make you feel more like yourself. Really important thing I ran into in Steiner's book, Theosophy, recently. Antipathy, complicated word for hatred. And as Steiner said, finally ground, it's called criticism. Uh, antipathy is about building us up, building our self up. The lower levels of the soul world have antipathy in them. It's when we get to the point when there's no more antipathy. Okay, we're at the human level now. And there are levels beyond that because there's sympathy. And the sympathy can become more intense. And you can really say, wow, and you can get, you know, you can get so you start radiating through your sympathy things that you have gained for yourself. You start to teach, you start to inform. You can move up to a level where you radiate out, radiate out healing forces. So selfish needs to be understood differently. Selfless. Selfless is not about having no self. If you look at Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, self-actualization is his term, uh, you see us <clears throat> getting up to a point where at the end of his life, uh, he said, really, it's self-transcendence. The self has been brought to an adequate level of development. And now... You can operate from beyond it. Steiner's pedagogical principle would say, you know, when we need to help each other about <clears throat> things like habit and so forth, we need to come from the higher level of our soul life. I'm avoiding our standard terms. We need to work with those things, with feelings and so forth. We need to come from a level of selfhood, a healthy selfhood. When we need to work with each other's Selfhood issues, we need to come from a level beyond that. So uh, selfless doesn't mean that we've lost our self. It means the self has begun to function in its true character. Think of Dr. King saying the night before he was murdered, it's not about me now. It's not about me now. Or Emerson, in his self-reliance essay, I actually am. So 
what is the role presently of humanity in nature with all of this power of selfhood? Well, people have begun to talk about us. I should know who said this first or best known for it. But humanity is nature becoming aware of itself. Think about Steiner's picture of, of a <clears throat> biodynamic farm. The human is the ego in that system. The animals are the soul. The plants are the life. Minerals, the soil is, is that level. Together, they're a whole organism. With humanity waking up, nature is waking up. So this maturing process for a plant, they develop too. They sprout, they leaf, they bud, they flower, they fruit, and then they produce seeds from which it began in the first place. An insect might have the stages of an egg, caterpillar, the winged flyer, who lays eggs again. There are transitions already worked with in nature. Higher animals may have an internal egg in the womb, then birth and a sexually immature stage, and then maturity leading to birth again. This is cyclic until we reach the human being. And the human being participates in this as an organism. But we also grow in consciousness not just in the body. And what happens to the consciousness? Well, that gets to our other question about what happens to my identity, to my self-consciousness. A very old question. Back before modern science, when consciousness was studied in the form of theology and philosophy, there was understood to be a sphere of ideas that rose up to the moon, the sublunary sphere. You've read old texts. It might even be in Shakespeare. And the question was, does this higher consciousness we awaken to as human beings, our reasoning and so forth, just dissolve back into that idea sphere? <clears throat> Thomas Aquinas had to assert against the leading Islamic thinker of the time that his own or an individual's own consciousness could go beyond this dissolution. It could go into the thought sphere and beyond and endure. And of course, Plato had already described how individuals could return or an individuality could return and enter a new organic body to reincarnate. And that was a widespread traditional view. Interesting question whether monotheism, the Jewish, Christian, and Islamic streams are <clears throat> isolating divinity into one point, which then should be understood to enter the human being and become that enduring self. Research question for somebody. All of this was put aside in the 19th century when Darwin's idea burst out on us. Darwin explored the circular processes of plant and animal organisms and realized that to survive, to keep that circle turning, the animal or plant had to have circumstances that met its needs or the ability to adapt to and endure whatever circumstances it found itself in. Otherwise, it died. And we're talking about a lot of species dying out these days. Darwin took for granted 
what earlier evolutionary thinkers like Goethe considered, which is the persistent shared inner character, the identity of all the beings of a given species. Take a bird, a robin, a blue jay, a finch. If its environment changes so that it needs a longer or shorter beak to obtain its food, those finches with longer or shorter beaks will survive and reproduce. With our subsequent knowledge of genetics, we can say that the internal organic information library for longer or shorter beaks got passed along. And when it favored the right sort of beak, the offspring could prosper. All makes a lot of sense. But what about simply being a finch? No matter how long or short the beak. We can also count that as genetics, but it's a more fundamental thing. It was so obvious Darwin didn't need to do anything with it. Finches don't just somehow show up as bluebirds or squirrels or frogs. And I think it's generally accounted <clears throat> creatures that can mate with another of their own kind are of one kind. That holds on. Darwin didn't need to look at it. The terminology can vary, but you might say that involution is the being what you are, a finch. And this can be called finch identity, and it stays the same. On the other side, evolution, not involution, but evolution, is how you meet the conditions of the world and adapt as possible to survive in those conditions. Involution, being a finch. Evolution, surviving as a finch. Now, the evolutionary insights of Darwin were quickly taken over to the situation of human beings and the social, economic, cultural situation of people, especially in Great Britain at the time, reinforced the idea that it was all a struggle for survival. The question of being an individual didn't really get reopened. So we, uh, catching up on the slides here. So we had had the idea from the Christian church in, in Western countries, what the uh, Bible says that uh, the human being was made uh, from clay with the breath of God. And in our materialistic time, we may have thought about we're made of clay and that's taken as a generalization for physical matter, but the breath isn't thought about. There were objections to Darwin immediately the first time his work was pre presented at the Royal Society saying, well, what, what about the higher abilities of human being? I don't see any basis for that in, in your evolutionary theory. But that ended up being all attributed to the brain and made physical. And so we get this idea of a Darwinian evolution. And it just leaves out the question of the human being and our power to be an individual. So today we have this reflexive effort, which ought to seem really silly, to explain everything about us um, as being evolutionary. Well, that I'm such and such with no kids may be an advantage for my nieces of which I think they're eight out of 14. And so survival of the fittest is still working. We can do better than that. The problem for Darwinism is really that human beings have the capacity of individually evolving their individuality. We don't have to stay the same. And that's quite apart from what's happening 
to humanity as a whole. Our core identity is flexible, fluid, changeable. Darwin wasn't looking at humans. He didn't address that. <clears throat> and then our identity is really a matter of consciousness, not matter. And in Steiner's day, there was a famous presentation, which I think still holds, that there are two things, they don't put it this way anymore, I think, but two things we will never be able to understand fully. One is matter and one is consciousness. So those were kind of the ends of science. You can't go beyond those. Okay, so we're all about matter now. And over at the other end, there's this consciousness thing. And how does that work? Well, you know, some people will be working on that. So uh, even as we uh, began to have technology and other kinds of progress changing everything, our individuality kept asserting itself. We were already divided in many ways. The slide just says, evolution of the human individual has led to change in everything else. We were already divided sex and gender, castes, races, religions, rulerships, et cetera, et cetera. With Protestantism, we got the priesthood of every believer. With French Revolution, we got the rights of citizens. Individuals began to break loose in the last several hundred years from every kind of affiliation and group consciousness. Socially, it gave birth a hundred or so years ago to anarchism and uh, open atheism. We just disconnected. I'm not that. I'm not with that. And it saw individuals asking to express themselves according to who they felt themselves to be. Socially and personally, it saw women, half of humanity, redefine the fundamental nature of their own being. Ms. Steiner's comment, well, the role of women, why don't we leave that to them? Huh? So, uh, <clears throat> We've now reached this extraordinary place where more and more individuals have asserted their independence from the sexual and gender associations of their own bodies, their own biology. And I believe this is a pretty ancient yogic practice. Say, I am not this, I am not this, I am not this, I am not this. Hmm. And a whole lot of people saying, hmm, I'm not this. With the technology we can now, okay, well, uh-huh, all right. Along with that breaking apart and all of these other ones, political, social, et cetera, it's something like the bursting open of a great seed pod. And that's what's happened with humanity as we come into our current time. With the changes in technology, changes in our relationships with each other and with the whole life of the planet, we now have to call into question our preeminent status as human beings and our judgment and ability to be stewards of life on Earth. As we go into a kind of a social chaos, we're also in the middle of conditions which we seem at least significantly responsible for, which uh, don't look so helpful or so healthy. The timing of Steiner's offering, he stressed a lot that the end of the 20th century would be a change time. And every time, as he said, is a change time, but this is a change time not quite like the others. He even said, some of you sitting here listening to me in Dorak in 1924 are gonna be back here at the end of the 20th century because it is, it's normally a thousand years to reincarnate his understanding. You're gonna be back that soon because 
Well, he didn't put it that way, but humanity itself is now at question. In a more practical way than just rogue species. We're responding to this in two kinds of problematic ways. One is to rush forward in our imaginations toward solutions that we can imagine without everyone's participation. So we either let the experts or the bullies or the machines take charge, something like that, pass the buck. The other is to retreat to old forms, forms of political rule of the few or religious domination, uh, according to however some group of people interprets their religion or all re religion, and they'd like to make that everywhere for everything. These are not expressions of human potential. They're retreats in the face of a very, very difficult situation. Both of these approaches see individual self-determination as expendable, if not fundamentally wrong. I haven't been able to see just what the time is, but I think it's time for a time check and I will stop. 802? Okay. So a couple more minutes and we'll have an opportunity for questions and discussion. Um, but let me just explain what I'm doing with these five things and repeat them. I am trying to develop a short, ha ha, short picture of all of this. I've done quite a bit with the first part, understanding identity as the evolutionary superpower of humanity and every individual. I've done some of the second part, affirming true fundamental values in religion, politics, science, society, yeah, society ecology. Yeah, and these won't all be my opinions, I hope. <laughs> I'll be curating, but you know. Conversation starters. So that's a second one. There's still the question of living into new perspectives for personal growth, resilience, self-reliance, surveying battlefields of the war on truth and freedom and individuality, and reshaping global culture, reshaping or creating a vision of a global culture that really meets fundamental human needs of all kinds and results in caring, creative societies where we recognize each other as extraordinary and unique beings and have reverence for each other. I would love to see all of anthroposophy, and I've talked about this here and in other Zoom presentations over the last 15 months, I'd love to see all of anthroposophy rendered anew in plain American 21st century English and then put on contemporary media because I look around and I don't see anything else that answers the needs of our time. And these aren't imposed answers. These are answers that open things up. You open up the question, are we evolving? You open the question, is, is this life, birth to death, the whole thing for me? You open up just those two questions. The way people feel about themselves changes and the way they feel about everything else changes. And that's what we need. We need people to feel a bigger canvas that they're working on, to feel that they have a chance to grow. If people feel those two things, it's bigger than I thought, and I can grow. The best of human nature will have a good chance to assert itself, 
against all the other things that are coming out. The three great beasts, the beast of fear, coming from all the power that's been released through Armand's helpfulness, the beast of hatred, inspired in our immature selves by the glory of Lucifer and the desire to be better than other people or to hate them if they appear better to us. And the third one, which sounds a little simple, doubt, but I heard transformed. When that doubt turns on yourself, it becomes despair. And we have su suicide rates going up significantly and really strong ones in young people. So humanity's facing these great primal challenges with all of their specific developments. And I'd love to see that getting out there, but for one person, what can I do? I've been working, you know, trying to get familiar with the more recent ways of talking about things, the more recent ways of putting things out like TikTok. I've got to learn Instagram. A lot of fun. I did switchboards, radio, TV, internet. AI is roaring down the tracks at us. I mean, it's probably run us over already several times and will continue to, tenderizing us, no doubt. But um, so the Being Human Project is something you can't just start at that scope. I can talk to anthroposophists about it, but I don't have the resources to try to launch such a thing. I have a crew of 150 people I could, but uh, <laughs> uh, so let's narrow it down. Where is this hurting? What's essential and where is that hurting? And so my conclusion is that identity, or as we say, individuality, is what makes us human. It is, if we want to talk in esoteric or religious terms, the Christ. It is the activity of that power in the world now. So it's absolutely fundamental. And because of its dual nature, me, myself, but everything I belong to and other people belong to different things and those things come into conflict. It's a, it's a political and social hot button. And among young people, you know, in my generation, 6% of people respond to the survey saying, yeah, I'm uh, LGBTQIA. Um, 18 to 25 year olds, it's more than 20%. It's an enormous change. And it's a, enough of a hot button so that really extraordinary people like J.K. Rowling of the Harry Potter books has basically been put in a corner because she's got a challenging view about the T in there. Lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual, queer, intersex, asexual, and then you still need a plus after that. But there's a question of identity. It's hurting. That's a point of entry. And I'm going to be trying to take these five things in some organization out to see if that can be shared. To give a larger context, a more philosophical context, a more cosmic context, but also a practical context for people who are living with that challenge. And it will be an attempt also to raise the identity question so people who feel they're defending their identity can also come to understand the identity challenge which all of us face and which are probably fundamental to the people who are attacking them for the identity they feel. So it won't be just to take a side in the war. It seems to me to be the place where you can start the conversation where people feel it. Now, when Steiner brought anthroposophy, 
or brought what he was bringing, he spent quite a long time as a public intellectual and got virtually nowhere. He said nobody understood philosophy of freedom except a few uh, American anarchists. And uh, so when he found the Theosophical Society and they asked him, okay, well now, we liked your lecture on Giordano Bruno. Could you come back in a month or whatever and tell us what you're working on? Well, what was going on then was the idea that you could have a scientific approach to religion and spirituality. That was a big deal in those days. That's when uh, Christian science was born and science of mind. It's a lot going on before World War I. In a certain sense, Steiner was taken captive by the Theosophists. <clears throat> and while they separated out into the Anthroposophical Society, they, we, they remained focused on that, learning more about esoteric things, occult science, astonishing great things, which are totally worthy of development, but they don't connect with people in the same way today. So it's also a question of liberating Steiner from how we've been carrying him, or I experience myself to have been carrying him and other people that I love and treasure and I'm grateful for, for a very long time. And we're at the hundred year point when he said, you've got to make it new or it, you know, he didn't put it this way, it becomes history. So is Steiner's initiative going to become history or is it going to have a new birth? That's the project. It is uh, something any number of people could do and should do, I would say, in their own ways. And anybody, I don't have this up on the screen, but anybody who might want to... Uh, help me with this, should do so. Hello, Andre. Now, my speaker is off up here. I'm going to turn it on so that I can hear you, Andre. And folks up here can hear it. And we hope we won't get any echoes or feedback. I'm hearing you now, Andre. And Yes, uh, yes, yeah. you're totally fine. Thank you. Uh... John, so much. And um, so, dear friends, we are moving to uh, question and answer sections. And, um, well, uh, yes, you know how to raise your electronic hand. So uh, please um, put your cursor on reactions on the bottom of your screen, click on it, and raise your hand. So, dear friends, if you have any, if you have any question, please go ahead. You can raise your physical hand too. <laughs> I can see everything. <laughs> or your etheric hand. <laughs> etheric hand, I cannot see yet. <laughs> so Tra Travis is first. Travis, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll jump in here and open it up for everybody. And thank you, John, for your presentation, uh, for all the work you put into that. Uh, I, I truly enjoyed it. And I couldn't help but think as you were sharing, you know, you mentioned that you had been studying anthroposophy for 33 years, you know, and I, and I got to thinking if I had been able to find anthroposophy when I was in my, you know, late 20s and early 30s, like you, you did, you know, where I would feel with that. And that's what was coming through to me in your presentation. It was like this culmination of what seeped into your soul as you studied anthroposophy all these years and this ideal vision of what you see for, for, for humanity. And uh, I applaud that. I, I, you know, I, you know, my story with anthroposophy is a little different. I, I'm a late comer to anthroposophy, but I had a hell of a life before I came to anthroposophy that prepared me for a lot of what I've learned and gained through anthroposophy. And I like the idea of identity, but be aware that Unity Church for years has talked in terms of divine identity. It's a big thing in Unity Church now. It's uh, affirmative prayer and learning to identify with our divine identity. I like that because, and it's to me, it's a separate from identifying with humanity. Yes, we're all part of humanity. 
And individuality, I like the term individuality, and you mentioned that. And just this week, I was getting a massage this week, and it's a business relationship I have with a woman. I I, I practice one day a week in her clinic, and she was working on me, and she's got this really strong personality, and it's been causing some conflicts in the office. And so, you know, as people were looking at me, you need to address this with her. And so I did, and I brought, and she used, she was thinking in terms of personality. I said, no, Carrie, I said, it's your individuality. You have a strong individuality, a strong ego, and, and you have a drive and a will that makes you go out there. And John, to me, the distinction is my individuality is a force that comes from within me. It's what I brought, and my individuality is what it's expressing coming out of me. My identity, I can identify with all of you. And I agree with you, I mean, a hundred percent with this little distinction. What we need in humanity is to identify with our Christ. I kept waiting for you to use the word Christ and to bring in and and, and I want some of the others to share about this. And so with the Christ, that's what we identify with, and that's our group. We need to grow and identify with Christ, and that's what needs to come. And that's the message, in my mind, the most important message I feel like I can relay when the opportunity presents itself is the idea of the two Jesus children. Start bringing about a radical new idea of Christ and what the Christ event was about. That's going to have the power to change the souls that need to be changed. You know, the, you bring about the change in the souls, it's going to bring about the changes in manifestation that you're talking about. But anyway, I say all that. Thank you for letting me share that. I'm going to get off and let others share. And John, it's always great. You know, you were one of the very first individuals that I connected with when I became an anthroposophist way back in 2006. And I don't know if you remember that or not, but were we in St. Louis at the, at the Central Region Council? And so I've always appreciated you, John, and I thank you for your presentation tonight. So Travis, let me just say that everything you share there is is right. And my only problem with it is if you're old enough to remember the fall of Saigon, now Ho Chi Minh City, you may remember pictures. It's kind of like 9-11 in the World Trade Center and people jumping off. Remember the helicopters pulling up with people holding on to ladders, rope ladders that were hanging down from them. Lots of people trying to get hold of that. Mm -hmm. My experience is that we're at the point where our entry point is 30 feet off the ground. And if you hear the right thing, given who you are, you may be able to reach that ladder. But there are 4,500 members of the Anthroposophical Society in America, and there are 100 million people in America who say they believe in reincarnation. That simply tells me something. I would also say it's good for us to think about Lucifer and Aramon as benefactors as well as challengers to our human development. Lucifer helps us with our idealism, our aspiration. Araman helps us with producing, being abundant. And then, of course, one of them wants to take us away separately, to elevate us, to turn us toward the past. And the other wants to control everything and rush us into the future. Now, that great statue is about not letting that happen because the human power is the Christ power, if you want to put it that way, the power of cosmic individuality. And my experience is we're way too comfortable with Lucifer in the Anthroposophical Society. And we're probably comfortable with Lucifer. There's a scene in the mystery dramas which explains this for me when, uh, when uh, the group is talking and Strotter comes out separate and he says, I see all of you ahead of me on the path. And this, this 
mystic mood that you talk about. But for me, spirit opens up only in action. Now, Strutter is defending himself as, as Marie and Benedictus show him. Then he is defending himself against Lucifer by leaning toward the Aramonic. He's the scientist. Whereas the others are defending themselves against Aramon by leaning toward Lucifer. Both are appropriate. But I don't hear many people who say, if we had 45,000 members instead of 4,500, we would have the resources to fund the School for Spiritual Science in this country. I've been talking about that for 14 months now. That sounds very aramonic. It's also just very practical, and North America is the region of the will. We're the people who stand out in North America by not exactly being with that. So I'm suggesting we, and I'm doing it myself. This is my project. Nobody else has to do it. But if we don't connect with people in the terms that are natural to them here today in North America, the whole process is going to be that much harder. There will be that much more suffering. It'll take that much longer. And so, yeah, maybe we could have a little arm on with his abundance and productivity. And maybe we could have a little more focus on will and on goals. That's essentially where I'm coming from, and I may be the only one, and that's fine. That's my identity. Thank Thanks, you, Jeff. <laughs> Dear friends, more questions to John, or maybe statements. Don't we have sure. a we have a question in the room here. You want to hop up to the microphone? Sure, I guess it's a it's a, it's a brief question. My question was just um, you uh, mentioned at the end um, that you would love people's um, help with this, and maybe you had more information on the on the slides online, but. Um, I guess I was just interested in concretely what what people could do. Yeah, well, um, I don't have a slide and I used to have a simple email that involved the word editor. That doesn't work for me anymore. So you'd have to uh, take note of this. I'm John H, H as in Harris Beck. So J H B E C K 23 at gmail.com, jhbeck23 at gmail.com. And you could probably also respond to the, uh, the uh, email from the Chicago branch, which Andre sends out. And I think Andre would forward it to me. Pretty confident of that, but thanks for asking. Yeah. And I know there are other people trying to do a variety of things, and I'd be happy to hear about what you're doing. And I can't stretch myself too thin. This is a big project, uh, even as small as I've tried to make it. But uh, I'd, I'd love to encourage other people and hear what approaches you're, you're taking. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So any questions from online? Oh, Bradley? Yes, Bradley. hi. Um, well, I'm not sure this pertains, but there was something that I was reminded of. Uh, apparently, Stanner wrote this down in Lucifer Gnosis in 1903. Um, it was about uh, in the necessity of trying to prove uh, convictions about karma and reincarnation with the results of science and that the inhabitants this is the task of the inhabitants of Europe and America in order to come uh, truly uh, able to come to the insights of spiritual science uh, 
Yeah, Bradley, I personally feel, you know, I, I remember what you're talking about. Um, he says if something to the effect that if you really think about what natural science has brought, the reasoning for reincarnation will become apparent. And for me, it's that separation of evolution and involution. And as long as we forget about the changeability of the core of the human being, the creative individuality that is growing in each of us through the power of the Christ, as long as we forget about that from the picture, we can just keep it all in a materialistic process. But once you say a person develops as a person, you end up, well, is that simply to be discarded? I, I, that's not enough yet, but I feel it's something in that direction. Have is you looked at, have you, forgive me for interrupting, but have you looked at all, I, I'm just asking, um, I, I've, I've taken a look at it. it. It seems to speak to me. I can't speak for others, obviously. Uh, the so-called karma research of Robert Powell in this regard. I don't know Robert's work in that area. No. He's written a couple of books called Hermetic Astrology 1 and 2. He goes into, he works on Steiner's research and uh, tries to show that there's like a connection between the sun, the angle of Saturn, in one incarnation and the angle of the sun in another incarnation and that there are scientific bases that might have something to do with uh, some realities that Steiner did uh, research on. That's another area. I mentioned the hundred million people who say they believe in reincarnation. They're probably, you know, it's, it's a degraded field. But uh, there seem to be close to that many Americans who say they believe in astrology. We have a wonderful new general secretary, and I'm aware of a lot of enthusiasm. She's both so well-spoken and deep in her insights. And we have a number of other people, including Robert, in that field. And... Uh, there could be specific lines of outreach. And again, it's something I tried to sketch over the last year for people where the society, rather than trying to present all of anthroposophy all the time, would have a basic core thing for, for members as we do now, but would develop specific areas that would reach out. The star wisdom would be one of them. And maybe 90 million people say they believe in astrology. If you got 50,000 out of them who are interested in our approaches, you'd have the resources to really develop these things. Again, you know, people have, ever since I met the society, people have been saying, well, you know, it's okay for us to be present in a homopathic, homeopathic dilution in culture, I don't buy that. <laughs> it's too small. One in a thousand, maybe, but not one in 10 million. Well, but yeah, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that uh, mention. Th there, is a, there is another question I have, and that is um, connected to meditations on the tarot with the I am sayings. Uh, connected to the human being um, uh, from the Gospel of St. John, that there's a correlation of uh, uh, I am the bread of life connected to the 12 petal lotus flower. And he talks about this path of Christian hermetic development where you transform the uh, chakras into a series of seven hearts. And I personally find that there can be. Um, something stimulating uh, and interesting in that kind of activity uh, for anthroposophists. Uh, I say that as somebody who has studied Rudolf Steiner and uh, Delta Tomberg in Meditations on the Tarot, 
and Robert Powell, uh, and has I have tried to find something significant in all of these kinds of things, and uh, I think it's also worthwhile studying Buddhism, for example. I think that can help people understand things too. I I quite agree. Uh, years ago, I read uh, a lot of Tom Berg, thought it was amazing. Um, and I guess where I'm at at this point is saying, we've got graduate schools going, but we don't have the university level. I'd say Tom Berg, what you say about Robert Powell, many, many other things we offer. We're getting very advanced, but the distance between that work and what a significant number of other people who could support it and engage with us in it and and bring it to a higher level of development, there's a big gap there. If we can fill that gap, then what Rudolf Steiner imagined of millions of people being engaged with this would be a reality. Yeah. There was uh, something very interesting uh, that uh, were in the notes of Albert Steppen that he... You know, dear friends, we have a number of uh, people with questions. We cannot continue for so long. I'm so sorry. So Sandra Whale is next. Thank you. Well, this whole conversation with Bradley pretty much uh, speaks very directly to what I was going to say and way beyond. So I'll just uh, I'll add a tiny little bit. Um, I own uh, Robert Powell's Hermetic Astrology books. They sit on my shelf. I probably will never attempt again to read them. <laughs> uh, his writing in gen, and I've known Robert forever. He was one of my first teachers, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think you just, you, 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 one of the last things you said, John, speaks very directly to what, to my seed thought, which was at the very beginning of your talk, you, I, I wrote them down on my little sticky note, evolution, reincarnation. If we could get people talking about just those two actually huge things, that would go a very long way. And then just to pair that, I'm just repeating the bits that I comprehended, but that really struck me from what you said. Um, it, a vocabulary, using a vocabulary in these conversations that, that meets people kind of where they are, where it's so tempting, you know, to bring in those of us that know a little bit about all this stuff to even the word anthroposophy can make people just go cross-eyed. Um, and you've talked a lot about this. And every time you do, I'm, I get excited because it just feels so possible and, and so right on that, that, that just these two topics, if, but, but I would wonder, and I'm not asking you for an answer to this, the entire presentation is kind of talking about it. You know, how to, how to have those conversations, how to begin without saying, oh, you should go read Meditations on the Tarot, or Robert Powell has written brilliantly about this, or go talk to Mary Stuart Adams, or any of those things that we could do that might make sense for us. But you just mentioned the gap, and I, I, I get that. <laughs> There's that gap between the graduate school and maybe you know the the high school that that folks might might be living in. So I'm simply repeating in my own words with my own comprehension bits of what I've heard you say and and thanking you for for being so clear in in your articulation of this whole situation. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so Christina is next, West California. Hi, John. So John and I know each other. We met in the six basic exercises a few years ago, and I've come to a lot of his talks. But the question I have for you, John, is what it feels like after listening again to this in-depth uh, is that we, what we need is sort of these intermediate active will people to bring this to the world. So I see you as one of these people. So how do, how do you see this work, which is your eye work going forward into the world? How is that gonna be practically applied? How, how do you see it? Is it a product? Is it a class? Is it a book? Is it courses? 
Is it in institutions? Is it in the anthroposophical society? Is it in schools? What? Well, to be a little more specific, I'm trying to develop uh, either five or seven two hour long online presentations and with a second similar length thing in the same week for conversation aimed at the LGBTQIA community uh, with, you know, uh, backup writings with uh, community space, you know, it's a lot more could be done, but to get started and uh, giving it kind of an edgy name, at least that's what I'm working with, of identity warriors. And uh, because I want to attract people who feel active about this. And then seeing whether out of the three people who show up, one of them continues to be interested. Or, you know, who knows? You just begin somewhere. And I know that's a place that is... Uh, that is intense. I see a lot of it on TikTok of all kinds. And uh, huh, as I've been advised, this is a community is waiting for an old white man to explain everything to them. <laughs> the 18 to 25 year olds are really looking for me. <laughs> but understanding that um, I do have some ancient credentials about uh, the good old days, AIDS and all of that. Um, and we'll see, just got to start somewhere. It's that Goethe quote, which uh, then got elaborated by somebody at some length, but Goethe just saying, you know, get started. You'll be surprised what comes to meet you. Thank so you. So that's, that's the point and it's not, you know, it's the point where I know there is pain and need. And so there's motivation. Okay, what's this old guy talking about this stuff for? And there are people out there like Jordan Peterson who are explaining a whole bunch of things to uh, millions of people which don't have the depth of what Rudolf Steiner offered and, you know, are more than a little bit tangled up in their own personalities and, you know, we got to be out there, is my feeling. When I say we, then I look in the mirror and say, oh, who's that? Well, I guess it's me. Thanks, Christina. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. So Diane is next, Walters. Greetings, everybody. And, and thank you, John, for uh, um, your wonderful presentation. I wonder if you know about the Anthroposophy and Social Justice Project? I do not. Now, did you get my email address? <laughs> I did. I'm currently, I'm going to be writing an article on gender and identity uh, for them. They are uh, basically funded to be, uh, to create uh, research around diversity, equity, the DEI movement. Um, as a response to what's going on with humanity today in North America. But um, my sources, I was in a meeting yesterday with somebody in Germany uh, and India, and it, it's happening worldwide. It's not just in North America. So the DEI movement that has overtaken OSNA, <laughs> the Waldorf movement, and, um, and, and many of the Waldorf schools here and across Canada, Trudeau has... Um, instilled um, the idea of DEI in and and gender uh, studies into kindergarten across the nation. This is now um, it being implemented in every school, public school across Canada. Mm -hmm. So the the response, first of all, I I highly uh, value your courage and your response to just begin it, and I I definitely will be in in touch with you. Um, my my article is going to go a little bit differently than yours, so I'd love to to tell you a little bit more. Um, but but so there's there's great there are a group of researchers really wanting to find the anthroposophical response to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and go down deep and create a symposium that will probably be in the Eastern Seaboard or in in Toronto in spring of 2024 just so you, you know about that. But um, 
couple of your comments that uh, I, I'm captivated by and um, the liberating questions of the idea of human evolution and the human being being unfinished, of course, goes back to Kulavint and his image of the unfinished human being. And when I was in the Barfield School of Contemplative Studies, you know, that very small window that was there for uh, a graduate school um, uh, that sought and worked out of anthroposophy um, that that uh, our dear, uh, oh my goodness, <laughs> Arthur, Arthur Zayas um, put together for just a very short period of time. But in so doing, I think uh, that mission and that 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 gesture was to try to enhance um, from a scholarly level and enhance the principles that anthroposophia holds um, in at at uh, a different level. So Kulavin's unfinished lesson or unfinished picture of the human being, I think, is 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 really key and that you opened with that um opens up the possibilities of everyone contributing to this idea of being unfinished especially the youth today because identity is being um finished right you can identify uh and 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 sector yourself off as you had, had suggested earlier on, and it's more about fixicity of mind rather than um, expansion of mind. So I think, uh, so one of the, the key things that I wanted to say to you was that this th there are groups of people actively exploring these topics out of anthroposophy. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Diane. That's, You're welcome. that's very encouraging. Yeah. And the connection to Georg. I didn't know him well, but I knew him a bit and uh, he was very special. Yes, he certainly was. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I do want to thank you for being human also. I've um, pretty much got every one of them upstairs and I really loved uh, um, the periodical and your work there. So thank mm -hmm. you for th that work as well. I just say that... Uh, it took the Council of the U.S. Society two years to decide to go ahead with that name being human. They uh, took me on in 2009 and wanted to turn the news for members, which was, <clears throat> you know, uh, had a colored front page and otherwise was black and white on newsprint. Um, into a magazine for outreach. And they said, well, it can't be news for members anymore. And uh, people at the time, anthroposophists at the time were not talking about human being or being human. I mean, that's a little twist of the phrase. And um, that's the thing I'm happiest about is I think we're talking about human beings, not just, you know, more elevated terminology and mm -hmm. it's accessible people are looking people are so thirsty for a sense of meaning and purpose to their existence so and we've I, got I, answers I, yeah. <laughs> we've I, got we've got hints we've got places to go looking you know people have to find it for themselves but where can they turn well, I think that a big part of I started podcasts a number of years ago. I haven't done one for two years and they're being downloaded every week for integral teaching. And I just bring Waldorf to principles and trade secrets to open air. And there are a lot of other people doing podcasts. The language today is Snapchat, podcasts, uh, Facebook, not really, but, you know, a little bit. And, and I think Andrew might um, go on about that. And, but in, in terms of AI, I think you're right. The, the being human is at the core of what we're fighting for, for human survival. And uh, anyone who's awake would know that. I mean, most most of us do. But it's um, and in the realm of AI and chatbot four, which is only four, I can imagine down the pike, 40 chatbot 40. So we <laughs> have to respond from an inner world with what anthroposophia brings to our inner work and as 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 uh, humans 
I think everyone here would agree that what you've brought has been um, a reminder uh, for us all to to work from the inside out. So thank you. And I'll stop talking now. <laughs> Thank you so much. So any more questions? Uh, so dear friends, we're working for one hour and 47 minutes. And I'm wondering if it's time to, to finish. Um, okay, Joel, you were silent. Yeah, please unmute, Joel, went. Yeah, unmute your machine, please. I'm unmuting myself, can you hear me? Hey. Yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, years ago, I had this riddle, which was uh, about all of these beings that Steiner would talk about, Lucifer, Airman, Sunbeam, and all his terrible things. And I asked myself, uh, well, if they could win, it had already be over. So there must be some force or some power that keeps them in line in a kind of way. And in my own research, that turns out to be the mother. Uh, we have a kind of wimpy ideas about uh, Sophia and the feminine aspects of, of our reality and just to give a hint to the direction of, of, of my work without going, a, a, you know, I could talk for six hours. Um, the four horsemen has a rider, have riders and that's her. So when we got hit with a plague, that was a spiritual right. If you get beneath the surface of things, instead of saying, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. So that's just a hint. Okay. She's earthquakes and all the rest of that bad stuff, the gate, gate of death. And some people are going to like this, but it, it's a tricky thing to understand. Uh, let's say the relationship between her and, and Christ. Uh, in Genesis, we are told that the first thing that happened was the creation of heaven and earth. Now, for some thinkers, heaven is the father and earth is the mother. It's after that act that God says, let there be light. So in uh, uh, one last thought, I'll could just keep going. In, in the, the prologue to the Gospel of John, it said that uh, it says, uh, in it, the word was life, and the life was the light of the world. Now, it's possible to do high energy physics and a bunch of things like that, and to realize that statement is not just beautiful religious poetry, it works at the level of physics. But then the problem happens is how many people in the society actually study the Gertian scientists? And I'll shut up after that. Thank you, Joel. I know you're from Montana. I'm from Wyoming. Down in Wyoming, we always looked up to you folks in Montana. <laughs> and you've reached some uh, remarkable elevations to be a little more serious. I think they're good ones to uh, kind of dream about. Well, you're very inspiring, John. I got a nice book from you recently, too. Thank you for that. Yeah. I exist to serve. All right, dear friends. I think it's time to conclude our session. Um, so, dear John, thank you so much for your efforts driving here in the Chicago and giving live presentation. Dear friends, thank you for joining us online. So, uh, for uh, for months of November and December, we have super intense program. So, we will have uh, 
presentation every single week. So I'm sending emails, it's very interesting. So it will be Andrew Linnell next, and then uh, Eugene Schwartz, uh, Leland Harris, and uh, Christopher Budd from UK. Um, so we're planning to invite, I mean, it's already in the schedule, it's uh, Richard Ramesbotham from UK. So stay with us. And uh, if you have a couple dollars to donate, please do so. Don't donate too much. So, but we own a platform which is uh, supporting our speakers. So we're paying speakers fee, you should know about it. So, because we appreciate the work of our, our friends. Yeah, and um, so, John, thank you so much again for your inspiring uh, presentation. Dear friends, please uh, feel free to unmute your machine and greet John and say thank you. Thank and you, I'll John. You Yay. Thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Oh. Yeah, good night, dear friends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Great job. Yeah, thank you, Andre. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Went from 18 to... to thank you all. You know... I'm totally with you. Participating. Totally in disagreement with you. Okay. Oh, good. oh, we can hear some sidebar conversations. In case it's not any use. Interesting. I actually knew John Money. John Money. Yeah. He's an originator of changing. Oh, yeah? Oh, okay. And the person you oh, biologically. <laughs> Terrible things he did. The person you were referring to about evolution. Lots of evolution being consciousness. Yeah. 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 What you are doing is not necessary. So thank you for your work and the work. Cheers. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? So I'm good. I think there's, right. uh, I didn't want to try to interrupt. Did you email it? You had enough yes, to do it. Uh -huh. Probably. You have enough to see with now. But uh, okay. maybe at some point I will send you some. But what are your well, well, struck me about your talk is that from Australia. Oh, yeah. right. so the, from which place? What occurred to me is that uh, perhaps the biggest left or obstructions left. we have for achieving this is it, is it rest or are or is it that oh. so oh, yeah. we don't write the same. There's a point where we're the same as everyone else, mm -hmm. oh. and it's that point that makes it. There's part of that, so we make a lot of makes it people I know. To push this forward from yeah, both sides. You mean we're not orchids and we can't yeah. pull up roots? Uh, and well, what I want air is there are two, two main things I would say. One of them is that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you modern people take the word prejudice yeah. as yeah. such a horrible pejorative yeah. that it only can apply to other people, mm -hmm. never to us. We're not prejudiced. Oh, you, you know she does, right? And I think Steiner yeah. actually showed that. Yeah. Well, it's all about to be talk of recognition. I don't mean in the sense in which because in our library, I think because it's around nine uh, to the presentation making so calling the worship about other type of people. That's part of my deal. Doing the but anyway, I think even now I get up like because there are people can hear prejudgment, prejudice, or we call it prejudice. You know, well, there is race. Actually, we started to be a race, but it was an anti-race. You need to go around here for some people. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's what I was trying to get to. Oh, the meaning they know. Because, you know, I've got like so many so friends. Well, 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 that. I think that in an excuse, he always not physical. Nobody pays attention. Context of the cocoa Hawaii. Because of it. And how poor I mean, that led to something good. The problem I've been going And I think some of the things that you see at the beginning of his autobiography of that nature. He was a child. And he had certain reactions to what are absolutely classical prejudicial remarks. Okay, 
But the point of his life is this is something that everybody has, if you're going to be honest and fight this overcoming this. And I remember there's the great one. There are many examples, no, but no, one no, that sticks always sticks with me was the one where uh, yeah, he's yeah, talking about like, the civils. Yeah, it's 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 like, it was kind of tried, but you know, I think the lady started like a lie for the grail. And every but, time uh, I went down the line, so we were passing the lead. He was shown to say, who he had absolutely this take to them and compared them, you know, very poorly to the prophets in the Old Testament. And so he just thought it was a dead end. Maybe, maybe. yes, right. Well, also, there they were the symbols at the time where we call them so they were behind their time. They were bringing something forward from the past. That so what, like, what did they do? do? So how do you get there? I really, I don't really have any sense about what's happening. Put it on under the creatures. I have a question. The situation never happened. So these are the ones that we have. Yeah, exactly. But then he goes on because I mean, then you know, I was there. And he transitioned. He moved on to something else. Your plan is happening a number of times. He asked the question, which is really how it works. He's the great old way for that. Mark Barrel is the big one. I don't think about it. That the question. He said, "Whatever happens, yeah, what am I throwing at it?" And then he was shown what happened. And after that, he was like, "Do not be afraid." He tells. What do they? What do they do? I hear people say, "Transform the black." He tells the story of the black box. That's what they're doing. I want to get out of these younger ladies. Don't go in. Okay, that's what they do. Why? That's exactly correct. Right. 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 Right even when the philosophy of freedom, he said, We're not more, none of us are more than the sun. He said, If we were, we would know everything. Some of us were more on the periphery. We only know certain things that we can count on. And we have to go to the next only a minute before the time fire and the fire is not seen from one Only a person that we can tell you. It's functional. Uh, we not go by what the prior experience. That's how we are human beings are constantly. <laughs> right. He said, I want to face value. So I think that's that's one of the resistances that we this kind of a program by the two media studies is that to develop one has to look for one's own prejudice and not somebody else's. Well, one of the things that I know I will have to take on the camera problem is nine hours. And I have not there to say where I send it to the whole. And they what's the what's the what's the, what's the time commitment? I was more on a thing or a weekend course or a national scene. Next thing you may have lots of things. It's a big time. You know what? What I would recommend to you, there's a woman named Christiane Gearnock. Have you heard of her? And I started and so we recorded and it was all away with it by it, but then I just take JK Rapp on myself every day. It was a pretty 
And I was snapped during the nine days and I signed up for it, but I didn't know I'll just do it. There's a male predators. There's letters. Even though or you stated a little yeah, this way, so you messed up this reason why really you're really wrong. Really busy on time. And until you work that out, really good. I could sort it. You should be talking about it all with me because I guess it's something in your thoughts at all. Okay. That's one they've thing. They've been famously oh, fragmented. Uh, they never say their names again. In Concord. Yeah. Is that the what? The Mitzrayim. Right. That's, um, you yeah. know. The, the. So, yeah. Very masonry stuff. More challenges. Than I think I've been missing. Um, worked with. Not the least. The least. They worked with it in Concord. So it's been. Like, and I apparently, I was still. Lose my mark. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going all the way to the end, but they have not developed separately. We're all working the down curve. <laughs> to bring them back together, but I would recommend just from having been to Shut up. one or five, <laughs> having read some of the letters. Lost it, really. Andre, amazing thank stuff. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, well, well, I can afford it. Should I write it on there? Well, well sure. I think, I mean, we got this very small. I have a pencil. That's right. We just. Uh, we need to change some things that we want. People change. Oh, well, so, how, are we going to how many Chicago people were online? <laughs> I, didn't I didn't see it. Okay. Honestly. But so the they, answer, answer, they've seen me, they know me now, they didn't show up except for some. No, no, no. Wonderful people. That, believe me, that yeah, is not I the cause. How <laughs> 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 we the first conference of uh, oh, uh, Leon? No, I think it's yeah. just that okay. the local okay. people tend to ignore all the communities. Yeah, well, they look at it and they think, oh, yeah, I'd like to go see that. And then they forget it. Well, they put it on the well, they put yeah. it I sent yeah. the old email and then yesterday and today. Yeah. And, you know, I know, but, you know, look at what you, I don't know what you do with your emails. But like when I get out of I, I, I look at them and I think, oh, that's a good thing. I'll do that. And then I forget, you know, and go talk. You're forgetting. Well, because people sit down and they look at a bunch of emails at once. And they think, okay, like, I, these 